This is VOA Africa. Hello, I'm Esther Gido Yort. It's Monday, June 29th. This is Africa 54. Due to the global outbreak of COVID-19, Voice of America is taking every necessary precaution to safeguard its employees. So our broadcast will look a little different today and in the near future, as we, out of an abundance of caution, reduce our staffing at VOA headquarters here in Washington. We're working to help keep you informed about what's going on. And we appreciate your staying with us on Africa 54. Malawi has a new president. Lazarus Chakwera was sworn in for a five-year term on Sunday. He defeated former leader Peter Mutarika in a rerun election. Chakwera, 65, won with nearly 59% of the vote in last Tuesday's election, a major reversal of the result of the original election in May 2019, which was overturned by the court. The repeat vote was regarded by analysts as a test of the ability of African courts to tackle ballot fraud and restrain presidential power. The Malawi Congress Party is Malawi's founding party, and Chakwera's win returns it to power after 26 years as the opposition. The judiciary infuriated Mutarika in February by overturning the result of the May 2019 election that had given him a second term. The court cited irregularities while ordering a rerun vote. Mutarika's disputed win triggered months of anti-government demonstrations, a rare sight in Malawi. Major spikes in COVID-19 cases is bringing renewed lockdowns across the United States and India. India reported another record one-day increase in confirmed cases Monday with nearly 20,000. The country trails only the United States, Brazil, and Russia in total confirmed infections since the pandemic began late last year. In the U.S., Florida, Texas, California, and Arizona are among the states that have seen a spike in their cases. Nationwide, there have been more than 35,000 reported infections for six consecutive days. Meanwhile, the number of global cases has passed 10 million and the number of deaths has passed 502,000, according to Johns Hopkins University. The World Health Organization says the number of new cases set another daily record on Sunday with 189,000, led by Brazil's 47,000 cases in a 24-hour period. Now to Africa, where residents in Guinea-Bissau are on alert after being warned by the head of the nation's COVID-19 response commission to prepare for a possible rise in coronavirus cases, according to Reuters. Former Health Minister Magda Nele Rolabalo is urging citizens to continue their preventive measures. Guinea-Bissau, a nation of over 1.8 million people, has seen its infection rate climb in recent weeks to over 1,600 with 22 deaths, most in the capital, Bissau. In North Africa, Tunisia reopened its land, sea, and air borders on Saturday for the first time in more than three months after announcing it has the COVID-19 outbreak under control. Families living in a poor section of Kenya's capital are using a virtual community currency to pay for food during the coronavirus pandemic. More than 500 people a day are signing up to the Kenyan Red Cross supported community inclusion currency known as Sarafu to get food, soap, and other essentials. Mohammed Yusuf has our report. Mukuru Kayaba, a slum in Kenya's capital, Nairobi, is home to at least 80,000 people. 49-year-old Jane Mutuku is one of them. She does manual work, but those jobs have been hard to come by in the past few months due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Today, she buys her food using Sarafu, a community e-voucher currency. For now, I have no money. I looked for a job the whole of yesterday. I didn't get any job. So I have decided to use my Sarafu to buy food. I have no food at home. Peter Odiambo store is one of 100 shops that accept the community currency. Together, the shops do about 10,000 US dollars worth of business each day using Sarafu. I can use the Sarafu to buy goods in the area. For example, 
If I want to buy rice from the big stores, I buy using Sarafu. For the things that are not available in my community, I turn my Sarafu points into local currency within our established groups. The groups help us to turn our Sarafu into Kenya shillings. Sarafu was developed by Grassroots Economics and US-based engineering firm Block Science. The firm puts financial contributions from donors into a community fund. The fund is leveraged to create and back the community credit. One Saraf is equal to one Kenya shillings. So when we register the community, we are able to give them a token of 400 shillings that now they are able to purchase uh, basic goods and services within the community. This, uh, uh, this Sarafu is able to multiply if they are able to engage in income generating activities or even their businesses. Like hundreds of thousands of Kenyans who have lost jobs, the people here struggle to make a living. For Mutuku, she'll be able to prepare at least one meal for the day, thanks to the community inclusion currency. Mohamed Yusuf for VA News, Nairobi. Since June 1st, South Africa has relaxed what was once one of the strictest lockdowns in the world due to COVID-19. When the restrictions were imposed in late March, many foreign visitors were stuck in the country, unable to leave. One American tourist, however, converted her involuntary stay into providing valuable work for residents of a local township. VOA Saqib al-Islam has the story. These children in Cape Town's Kealija Township received free homemade masks thanks to a unique partnership between a local activist and a stranded American tourist. I believe that everyone that travels, there's always a way that you want to meet locals. So I play a role in a way that I connect the visitors and the locals. Kilija Township is one of the biggest urban shanty towns in the world and the second largest in South Africa. Juma Mikwela started art tours for international visitors to help underprivileged residents with food and necessities. But everything halted after a strict lockdown began in late March. Essentially, um, what it meant that um, you cannot leave your residence unless you're going to a grocery store, a pharmacy or a doctor. Paulina Migolska, an American tourist, was Miquela's last client before lockdown. And I thought of Juma. So I texted him. I said, hey, listen, if I started sewing masks, fabric face masks, would that be helpful? He said, absolutely. Migolska spent the last day prior to the lockdown buying fabric and finding a sewing machine. At this point, together, we distributed a little bit over 300 masks. About half of them um, were masks that I make and another half were donated by Sexy Socks. Sexy Socks is a social enterprise in Cape Town which provided Migalska an essential services permit to go out and distribute free masks during lockdown. It was also giving away a pair of socks to a child in need for every pair they sold. But now they're giving away masks instead with the help of Migalska and Nukwela. Oh, and that's part of our idea is that we, we got to give, give some back. Um, and she had the perfect avenue to market. So it's really just a, um, a coming together of a number of lucky events. And one of the lucky events was Migalska's sister, Pamela's wedding, which brought Migalska and guests from 25 different countries around the world to Cape Town. Almost everyone in wedding party left before the lockdown. Migalska's tourist visa has expired and she is scheduled to leave the country on July 4th, but not guaranteed. I actually felt safer here than anywhere else in the world, especially as compared to, you know, back home in America. She says part of the reason is her work and valuable partnership with Mukwala. So it's my home, but it is also your home as part of the experience. Sakibul Islam, VOA News. Coronavirus infections are continuing to surge in the United States. Not since March has there been a spike like the numbers reported in June. VOA's Arashar Basadi reports from Washington on how lawmakers, along with state and federal officials, are reacting to the grim news. The advice of experts hasn't changed. Wear a mask in public, keep your distance, and wash your hands. This is part of a process that we can be either part of the solution 
or part of the problem. If we don't extinguish the outbreak, sooner or later, even ones that are doing well are going to be vulnerable to the spread. So we need to take that into account because we are all in it together, and the only way we're going to end it is by ending it together. The United States has 4% of the world's population, but accounts for one quarter of the more than 10 million confirmed cases of COVID-19. Cases in the state of Arkansas alone jumped nearly 25% this week. Arkansas Governor Asa Hutchinson calls for more testing. We've doubled the amount of our testing nationally. Uh, we've got to double it again. That is probably the most important thing that we can do. And I'm concerned as a, as a state, while we've increased our testing dramatically in Arkansas with the demand for testing from California and some of the Texas, some of the high population states, how is our commercial providers going to keep up with that? Hutchinson called for greater use of the Defense Production Act, which gives President Donald Trump emergency authority to control domestic industries like those that make protective gear. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi said mandating the use of masks across the country is long overdue, something the Trump administration had not done. The Centers for Disease Control has recommended the use of masks, but not de demand, uh, required it because they don't want to offend the president. And the president should be example. You know, real men wear masks. Be, be an example to the country uh, and wear the mask. It's not about protecting yourself. It's about protecting others. The president generally does not wear a mask in public. And at a recent campaign rally in Oklahoma, Trump blamed increased testing for the U.S.'s disproportionately high number of cases. Testing is a double-edged sword. We've tested now. 25 million people. Here's the bad part. When you test, of, when you do testing to that extent, you're going to find more people, you're going to find more cases. So I said to my people, slow the testing down, please. The number of deaths nationally tops 125,000, and global fatalities are just shy of half a million. Arash Arabasadi, the OA News, Washington. He's got the sniffles. Staying at home is one of the strategies that authorities in the United States are relying on to reduce the spread of COVID-19. But how does that work for the almost 600,000 people who are homeless in the U.S.? VOA's Veronica Balderas Iglesias went to the streets and shelters of Washington, D.C. to get a first-hand look. A. Addison doesn't look like your typical homeless person. He was once a counselor for teenagers in trouble. But these days, he lives on the streets after falling on hard times. The toll it takes on the body physically, uh, psychologically and emotionally, um, you know, having to get back and forth just to get breakfast, lunch, dinner, clothing, shelter. And now there is COVID-19. Not having cleaning agents or disinfectants in spaces, regardless of where it is, I think opens up the potential for people to get the infection. Alexson is one of nearly 600,000 homeless people in the United States, based on the most recent official count. In a pandemic, they are at special risk. Of the 527 COVID-19 deaths in Washington, 20 were homeless people. As a group, their risk of death is about double that of the overall population. As folks come in and as we do checks throughout the day, uh, if folks say that they're feeling symptomatic, uh, we'll take them out of the population. Uh, of the shelters and we'll bring them to one of our isolation and quarantine sites and we'll test them there. Uh, if that comes back positive, then we'll go back and we'll find the close contacts for that person and also ask them to come into our isolation and quarantine as well. Around the country, officials have to stop shelters from becoming a breeding ground. About a couple weeks into the pandemic, um, people quickly realized that it was spreading inside shelters very, very, very fast. And a lot of the focus was to do what we call deconcentrate shelters. So um, they started moving people out of shelters into larger spaces. Um, some jurisdictions rented arenas and others did hotel rooms. 61-year-old Mary Montalvo lives in a nearby park. She gets food and hygiene products from local nonprofits and churches. But a new mask? That is tougher. We try to give one, I'd say, every uh, second or third day. But many of the people wear it, lose them. Where do you go if you need to wash your hands? Um, that's very difficult. I, uh, 
go inside the church here, but I have some cleanser uh, that I carry in my uh, jacket and I use that. COVID-19 has made it harder for those like Michael Williams, who's looking for work. Day centers have adopted strict social distancing. It takes extra long to get services you need because they only allow one person at a time. Without these spaces, it's kind of hard. I'm not able to apply for jobs. I can't get any income, and it's, it's crazy. U.S. unemployment is at a staggering 14%. A Columbia University study projects the homeless population may grow 40 to 45 percent this year. I expect that if unemployment um, continues to stretch for a long period of time, that we will start to see decreases in rent payments and we will start to see eviction. The U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development has announced almost $3 billion in aid for homeless Americans and those at risk of losing housing. But that's just temporary. In the capital, housing is really expensive. And so until we start addressing how to have steady employment that pays closer to the cost of housing, we're going to keep seeing this crisis of homelessness. For VOA News, Veronica Valderas Iglesias, Washington. We'll be right back. Hello, I'm Lina Mudu, your VOA health correspondent. During the COVID-19 pandemic, the World Health Organization says there are currently no drugs licensed for the treatment or prevention of COVID-19. And there is no proof that hydroxychloroquine or any other drug can cure or prevent coronavirus. The misuse of hydroxychloroquine can cause serious side effects, illness, and even lead to death. For more information on COVID-19, visit who.int or contact your local or national health authorities. One month after George Floyd, an African-American man died in police custody in U.S. state of Minnesota, protests against police brutality and for wider racial justice have spread not only across the U.S., but throughout the world. Isha Sarai looks at the sustained motivation of these surprisings. Advocates for racial justice say that the protests seen across the United States in the past month are not new, organic, or solely because of George Floyd's death. The movement has been built on years of organizing and a growing list of individuals killed at the hands of police. It arrives at a moment in which the public's patience for police misconduct has been expended. And so the George Floyd video arrives after the video of Philando Castillo in Minneapolis, after the video of Jamar Clark in Minneapolis, but also after the video of Tamir Rice, Walter Scott, Laquan McDonald. Black Lives Matter! We want police! Some demonstrators have noted how the COVID-19 pandemic has contributed to the sustained motivation of nationwide protests. I I'm all, like, I already have to fight systemic racism. <laughs> I have to fight a like a virus that I do not understand, that no one understands, and you're still killing me on national TV? Like, just something's got to give. This year, social media, fundraisers, and petitions have accompanied rallies in the streets. You have the highest unemployment rate you've ever seen before. People actually have the time right now to go out into the streets. Now, you realize that you and your friends can, you know, create a petition, can sign something, can, you know, get folks out on the street, can volunteer to bring water. Black Americans who have taken to the streets in recent weeks note that discrimination and violence against them is nothing new. I live it, right, because I was born a black woman, right? So this is not something that I'm just coming to realize. Activists note that an increase of organizing and educating on social media has contributed to wider awareness of the movement. Young people, crafting hashtags, crafting messages, uh, engaged in serial strategic disruption of daily life, globalizing the message, tying it to a set of public policy reforms, and pushing the conversation, changing the civic vocabulary. Black Lives Matter! 
While the specific circumstances of the 2020 protests for black lives are different than previous ones, activists believe the current movement is the result of years of organizing. News, Washington. 25 years ago this month, a landmark U.S. medical trial began testing a drug that would prove to be the first effective treatment of HIV AIDS. It spawned a generation of drugs that saved countless lives and is still helping to prevent the spread of the virus today. VOA's Caroline Presuti takes us back to a time when the AIDS epidemic raged unchecked and introduces us to a man who would not be alive today without the advent of these drugs. Kevin Lee Taylor was 22 years old when a nurse told him he tested positive for HIV, the human immunodeficiency virus. And I looked at her like, I'm sorry, I have what? <laughs> and she was like, H you know HIV? I was like, no, I don't. I've, I don't know what HIV is. I've never heard of HIV. A doctor then entered the room and told Taylor to get your affairs in order because there's, there's no cure. There is no treatment. There's nothing we can do. Shocked and numb, Taylor walked back to his Richmond, Virginia home. The year was 1985. HIV, the virus that causes AIDS, carried a stigma. Many with the virus were shunned. Something Taylor saw in a news report that very night. Protests erupted at an Indiana school over the attendance of Ryan White, a student diagnosed with AIDS after a blood transfusion. I'm thinking to myself, you know, if, if they're this hostile to a, a little nine-year-old white boy, can you imagine how they're going to react to me? So Taylor, a gay man, told no one and was symptom-free for years. Eventually, he was hospitalized when his immune system collapsed and his HIV turned into full-blown AIDS. There were no effective AIDS treatments, and by 1995, more than 300,000 Americans had died. I hate to be blunt, but it was killing gay people, so who cared? For years, groups like ACT UP staged loud protests demanding more funding for HIV AIDS treatments. In his last video interview before he died in May, ACT UP founder Larry Kramer told VOA the AIDS community felt abandoned. We were all operating on our own to bring to the world the message that we were dying from this mysterious virus, uh, which was killing everybody. Kramer's group, whose mantra was silence equals death, stormed the U.S. Food and Drug Administration, the agency that approves new drugs. Richard Klein worked for the FDA at the time. I think that was a great wake-up call for FDA, actually, because they, they did manage to essentially close down the building, close down the agency. Slowly, change began to happen. AIDS activists were named to serve as patient advocates on FDA advisory committees. Government-funded research focused on how to boost survival rates. Testing and review were fast-tracked for drugs, including a new type called protease inhibitors. When combined with other medications, they blocked the virus from replicating and growing resistant. Suddenly, you took the barrier and made it very high for the, for the virus to jump that barrier and become resistant to all three drugs that are in this combination. In June of 1995, the FDA authorized a study of sequinavir, the first protease inhibitor. In December, lightning speed for the government, it was approved as part of the first effective and durable drug cocktail. For decades, Dr. Anthony Fauci has led the U.S. government's efforts to combat HIV. It completely transformed the lives of HIV-infected individuals because it was the first time we had a highly, highly effective drugs against HIV. Among those saved was Taylor. One pill a day. Now, 57 years old, he's still taking the drugs that have kept him alive for decades. Not necessarily be cured, but to at least have some kind of a life as opposed to just living in the shadows waiting for it, 
for your end to come. Every day is a good day. Mm -hmm. More than a million Americans live with HIV today, and more than 37 million globally. While mortality rates have plunged, a vaccine and a cure remain elusive. Carolyn Prasuti, VOA News, Richmond, Virginia. In our sports news, the coronavirus pandemic has some world athletes struggling to stay sharp for next year's Tokyo Olympics after training facilities were shut down and competitions canceled this year. Ugandan runner Halima Nakaji, the gold medalist in the 800 meters at the 2019 World Athletics Championships, is doing her best to prepare under the restrictions imposed by COVID-19. Halima Thumani reports from Kampala. 800 meter women's world athletics champion Halima Nakai is trying to stay in top shape for next year's Tokyo Olympics. With the games postponed and Uganda's gyms and stadiums closed since March to curb the spread of COVID-19, her only option is Kampala's open roads. But the 25-year-old runner says training at home is the least of her worries. Around January, February, we had got an opportunity to participate in the indoor games, of which the main target was Tokyo. So due, due to COVID, all the races were cancelled. And uh, the worry, mostly being a lady, I ha my time in sports is so short. So I have to use my body, if it's in position, to deliver good results. Stuck in Uganda and without international competitions, Nakai trains with other runners who are also preparing for the Tokyo Games. They are only allowed to train in small groups to abide by measures to curb the spread of the virus. For some of Uganda's athletes, the lockdown and delayed Olympics has also been mentally challenging. We have to focus, we have to remain in training because next year is Olympics. This year there is nothing, just only diamond leagues and the other year it's World Championship. The Diamond League is a series of top-tier athletic competitions for elite athletes. Most of the competitions have been cancelled, although there is hope one might take place in Monaco this August. Uganda's National Council of Sports admits the pandemic has posed challenges for athletes to stay fit and motivated for another year. It's been very challenging because in an Olympic year is when the athletes are most fit. I've got to say, that's when their bodies, their minds are in the best shapes of their lives because they are trying to do everything to win Olympic gold or to raise their status. Now, without the Diamond League happening, um, it's a very unfortunate situation for one reason, that um, that is where they make most of their money. These Ugandan athletes hope that restrictions on international competitions can be lifted as soon as possible. Nakai wants to race at the Diamond League in Monaco in August, assuming that COVID-19 is by then under control. Halima Athmani for VA News, Kampala. And that's our show for today. Be sure to watch Africa 54 on our website at voaafrica.com. From all of us here in Washington, thank you for watching. Thank you.